shaking out there this is Andy coming to you again from here at my daily funk club headquarters and um, right on right on it's a beautiful day here in Colorado and uh, we're gonna make another video so uh, who's ready to have some fun I know I am um, today is uh, gonna be fun for me because I get to show you one of my favorite basses I know I say that about every bass that I play because they all really kind of are um, my favorites you know I love them all and they're all the way they are for a reason because they work for what I do but this particular one is spectacular I was recently in Ohio at the um, Midwest Rhythm Summit and I was talking to um, Tom Ballas from Bass Gear Magazine and we were we're both you know big time gear heads I guess you could call us and um, we were playing a lot of his instruments he has a wonderful collection of instruments and I was talking, and 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 uh, and I and I was also hanging with Pete Scholl, and he had, and um, you know, he has some MTD instruments, and um, I was t telling him how amazing this bass is, and how um, just just everything about it is so so awesome, and it's not that it's like overly um, amazing to look at. It's not like one of these beautifully figured you know um burled kind of um wood top instruments you know bases that i call like coffee table bases <laughs> i'm just joking but you know what i mean you know instruments that are really exquisite um highly figured wood grains and things like that this is kind of like it, it's kind of like a like a sleeper car you know what i mean like a muscle car that when it pulls up at the stoplight you have no idea what's about to happen <laughs> And um, it's just it's just very simple. It has an alder body, a maple neck, a rosewood fingerboard. It has a great electronics and pickups arrangement in it, which is the Bartolini uh, J in the front and humbucker at the bridge. Three band active passive preamp with um, mid select push pull mid select. It has the vintage bent metal hip shot bridge and uh, ultralight tuners, and that's about it. But it has an amazing amount of um, care that went into the details of how it plays and how it feels and just the, and, and how it sounds, you know. Um, let's hear it. <laughs> say held up I mean I haven't had to do anything to it I haven't had to make adjustments to it the neck hasn't moved the frets haven't grown out the edges of the fingerboard um, it's, you know which means it hasn't dried up the fingerboard hasn't dried up it came to me really kind of settled it came to me really kind of done when I say done I mean a brand new base sometimes they take a while to settle they finish drying and um, they move around and you know it's organic matter it's it's, it's wood material and uh, sometimes it takes a while for an instrument to um, to open up you know what I mean um, they kind of have like a like a like a like a crisp candy coating on them and once that wears off they start to get warmer and they start to open up and they start to um, just have a, have a more mellow um, broken in kind of tone and feel you, often that takes time, you know what I'm saying? You have to play them for a while, up to a year or two before they really start opening up and feeling broken in. Well, this one came to me 
like that, you know. Um, it was it, it just had that kind of feel right away, and um, I attribute part of that to the the type of finish that's on the back of the neck. It's not a heavy lac. It's not a heavy high polished lacquer, and the body just has a um, a um, like a satin, uh, like a transparent satin black stain over the alder, and uh, it just feels it, it feels great. It feels great in the hand. Um, and against the body um, and uh, as a result all of those things that I just mentioned it goes on a lot of gigs with me it gets a lot of use you know Michael is um, is, is, is a legacy uh, is a legacy builder known for prestige always has been I just boosted the treble a little bit and now I'm going to roll to the back pickup a little bit They're very simple, and at first appearance, they might seem like they're um, uh, less high quality than a high mass bridge, but they have a performance factor that's really important, and I think that it contributes a lot to this bass. Also, to my orange sparkly Nordy uh, bass that I call Excalibur, that one has the same bridge on it. Um, there's a there's a low mid openness that uh, really stands out. So they're really open sounding and really lively with the bent metal bridge. It's an important factor. So I always tell people, don't give up on a bass. You know, if it sounds too dark and um, if the bass is, is acting like too dark and it's too, a little bit too murky, um, too dense sounding, put one of these hip shot bent metal bridges on there. It'll open it right up. Sound. I can find myself always wanting to slap on this. And incidentally, while we're talking about slapping, this low B string is fantastic, right? This is a 34 inch scale instrument. Um, I can only play 34s. So I have a couple that are 35s and one that's even longer than that, my dingwall. For some reason, I don't have a problem on the dingwall because of the way that the fan frets are laid out. I, I'm able to really kind of do it without missing notes and without uh, experiencing any, any strange um, pain. But typically on 35s, uh, five strings, it's really reachy for me, you know? I feel this extra reach and it, it hurts my neck and my shoulder and my arm and my fingers and everything. Um, so I play 34s, and uh, a th there's nothing wrong with a 34-inch five-string bass if it's done right, because obviously this B string is doing its job just perfectly. It has plenty of uh, low-end fundamental. There's no flat. It's not all loosey-goosey and rubbery. It's super tight. It's a wonderfully tight low B on a 34-inch scale.
Saratoga um, Jack 5, that's the model, Saratoga Jack 5. It's just one of those basses that um, it has kind of a very simple yet elegant uh, look to it, but it is a performer in every way, and I could not be more pleased about that. It's one of my favorites, and it's truly one of the best, one of the best basses that I have. So kudos to Michael and Daniel, and thank you to everybody at Dana B. Goods who also are affiliated with that uh, family and um, they've all been big-time supporters here at the Daily Funk Club. Now before I go I do want to take a little time to talk about the Bergantino rig that I'm playing through. This is the Forte had the HDN 210 cabinet and the HDN 212 cabinet. Right off the bat I can tell you that this 212 cabinet is one of the best I've ever played through. I absolutely love it. It's a beast of a 212 cabinet. As a standalone it'll do any game pretty much any gig that I can think of that I play um, in terms of getting big enough and getting loud enough. And um, I think about 12 inch uh, cabinets, you know, for the longest time it was all about 10s and 15s, you know, um, maybe a long time ago back in the 60s when when bass players were using Marshalls and stuff like that, there was this 12 thing going on. But in the, um, you know, for, for most of the last 30 years or whatever, the 10s and the 15s have been the go-to bass kind of cab thing. The most popular, let's just say. And in recent years, and maybe like the last 10 years or eight years or whatever, the 12s have come back. And the 12s are fantastic because they have a great low mid thing going on that um, really kind of behaves well. Uh, big drivers, you know, the 18s and, and uh, in, 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 in even 15s and, and, and multiple small driver cabinets like a 410, they can get too big, and if you're using them in a certain performance areas, like a gymnasium or places like that, you know, big, giant, boomy kind of places, hard surface places, they can get real boomy and you can't hear anything. And uh, all, you, you can, you're, you're fiddling with the EQ con constantly just trying to get that boominess to go away. And um, what I found is that with these 12 cabinets, they behave really well in just about every kind of performance scenario. And uh, for me, I like it with the 212s and the 210 together on a big situation where I'm having to, you know, really have some muscle. You know, when it comes to amplification on a gig, I bring more than I need. You know what I mean? I don't bring just barely enough and then push it as hard as it 
as it, as it can, you know, I don't push it to its limit. I bring extra and then I allow myself a lot of headroom and I get the best tone that way because I play with a lot of dynamic range. I like to play soft and also really dig in really, really hard. And there's nothing worse than when you're digging in really hard and the amplifier uh, or the speakers or the system in general denies that. So I bring extra. But it's no problem with this stuff because it's so transportable and so lightweight. The cabin, the, the, the 210 is like really easy, one hand. And this, in, in this 212, sit it on its side, grab it with one hand, no problem. I can walk along carrying it in one hand. Um, it's, uh, in terms of the tone, uh, very, very clear, very articulate, and very even, very uh, transparent, kind of um, evenly represented tone. No, it's not like the back in the days, you know, when the SWR Goliath came out, the SWR Goliath had a sound, and it was kind of a hyped boom sizzle cap. Not kind of, it was a hyped boom sizzle cap. You know, lots of lows, lots of deep punchy lows, and lots of sizzly high end. That defined an era for bass cabinets, and many, many more to come that imitated that, and, and a sound that bass players were going for back then. And um, these do something quite a bit different. It's a much more um, even-tempered uh, presentation of all the frequencies. So, again, like for a player like me, I get a lot of the variety of type of sounds and stuff that I get is coming off my hands and coming off the instrument. If I'm, if I'm messing with anything, it's the blend control on the bass. That's pretty much the only thing I touch. And uh, if, if you can see, I don't know if you can see, the EQ is completely flat on the amplifier. <laughs> Each cabinet does have a high frequency horn in it, and I have them both set at about 30% right now. I love horns in cabs, but I don't crank them way up. I keep them down, way down. 30% is about pretty much where I always leave them. And I have great, great you know, success with that. I love that. It's my neighbor that needs to get a new muffler on his pickup truck. It always reminds me of that movie, um, I forget the name of it, it was a Chevy Chase movie where they buy it, where they buy this house, I think it was called Money Pit or something. No, it was a different one. But anyways, they, they, they buy this house out in the woods and every time the mailman comes by, he's got this old pickup truck that's really, really loud. Anyways, going back to the, to the tone of the Bergantino and the, and the high frequency drivers, um, I keep them at about 30% and everything's perfect. I love it. It gives me the, the amount of that, that little amount of kind of shimmer that I like, but it doesn't become oppressive. And um, it helps to distribute it in a nice even way throughout the performance area too. Because if we crank up those horns all the way, we can um, take people's face off with them, you know, out in the room. So. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Use them, but use them. Find the sweet spot where they, where they um, really do a good job. And then, and then the other thing that I do that I, you know, is, might be interesting to some people is that if I'm playing outside, I turn them off completely. If I'm playing outdoors in an outdoor performance area of any kind, I turn the horns off. Because for some reason, it's harder for the low end to get everywhere outside. So... And it's easier for the high end to go everywhere outside. So we can get ourselves into a situation where we have a really bad sound really easily by having our uh, high frequency drivers turned up too high in an outside performance environment. So that's just a little tip from my own personal experience. Turn them off when you're playing outside. Um, variable ratio compressor. This thing has one of the best sounding variable ratio compressors that's built into an amplifier that I know of. I love it. Here's without it. See what's happening is it's it's bringing up the game. adding the the compression while bringing up the gain so it's not like the type of thing where the more you turn it up the more it squashes the sound actually the more you tune it turn it up the more it opens up the sound but at the same time it's bringing the um 
cabinets into a really nice tight place. Anytime that we can use some compression or some limiting, it's really going to make our cabinets perform to their best. And it's going to make our amplifier also perform in its most efficient uh, possible way. It's going to take away some of those really um, transient things that happen. And whether that be excursion or whether that be, um, you know, um, transient peaks that are, um, you know, like when we slap it, that millisecond, that, that, that amplifier having to deliver that, particularly in the low end, having to deliver that in a millisecond, uh, it's hard, on, it's hard on the power module, you see what I'm saying? So having the variable ratio compressor is super, super helpful. It just smooths everything out. You know, electronic equipment is seems like it doesn't have a soul. <laughs> you know, like an instrument, we think the instrument has a soul and an amp, it doesn't have a soul. But it, it, it kind of does. And the way that you can know that your amplifier has a soul is that when it's performing really well and it's not in pain, it's saying, ah, you know, it's, it's happy. And everything's, you know, and the compressor really helps with that. You know, it's like easing up on it and using a technique that's not just, um, not just really, really um, driving it so hard. You know what I mean? Like you got to finesse, like when you're, Plowing a field with a mule. You gotta finesse your mule. The mule is doing hard work for you, so you have to be kind and treat it nicely and it'll do the work for you. It's the same thing with electronic equipment. You can't just plug in and start completely bashing away and, and, and boost all the EQ and, and, and crank it and just see how loud to try and see how loud it will go and see if everything will will sound good and operate with everything dimed all the way on ten or whatever. If you do that, you are gonna damage your equipment. You have to learn how to operate it. It's the same thing with driving a car, you know what I mean? If you or I jumped into a, a Formula One car and tried to drive it, it, we would be grinding the gears and we would spin the thing out and it would sound like, you know, really, really bad and it would not, you know, be good. But if a guy who knows how to drive a Formula One car gets in it, he can finesse it, you know what I'm saying? He can maneuver it get the most out of that performance of that of that machine. Same thing with amplifiers. So, yeah, there you have it. Right on. Thanks for watching this video. Thanks for watching all the videos. and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Peace.